Uh, well, hello everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. And uh, welcome to Untrusted Executor, Execution, Attacking the Cloud Native Supply Chain. Uh, I'm Francesco, Security Engineering Manager for Control Plane. I will introduce myself momentarily, uh, but for now, I want to thank Darren very much and all the uh, Ethicode folks for um, uh, having me and also for the great work, uh, the upfront work uh, in, uh, you know, uh, making available rehearsal room and do all the technical pre-checks. So excellent organization. Thank you very much. Um, so a little about me. I spent a significant number of years uh, in academia. Then in 2011, I joined the European government as a security engineer. I was in the uh, IT security team uh, working on data security, um, network security, and system security and hardening. After a few years, I moved to Imarsat, a global satellite mobile company based in London. Um, my first role was a chief security engineer for the satellite control center. And then I moved into security operations engineering. I would lead uh, the uh, uh, the team in charge of designing, deploying, operating uh, technology stacks for security operations, and then I expanded my role, becoming head of security engineering uh, for the company. So my all uh, my my team, uh, a bigger team, would also consult internally to all the business units on their um, uh, on their projects. And then um, after a few years, I moved to um, control plane where I am now. I'm security engineering manager, so I manage the security team, uh, 12 consultants in the security architecture, um, security engineering and pen test uh, spaces. And as you can infer, I like anything done on rocks, uh, even better if they're covered with snow. Um, right, so a little uh, information about the control plane. We are a cloud native security consultancy established in 2017. Our headquarter is in London, but we operate uh, globally. We have offices in uh, North America and in APAC. Uh, our clients include uh, governments, financial services, and in general, we like to work with regulated industries. Uh, a quick shout out uh, to uh, the book written by our CEO, Andy Martin, published by O'Reilly, Hacking Kubernetes, a goldmine of uh, information on how to attack and defend Kubernetes. Uh, if you scan the QR code, you can download for free the first half of the book. Not trying to sell you anything is literally uh, uh, on our website. Right, so what will we be talking about today? Um, we'll talk about the um, software supply chain problem. And from now on, when I say supply chain, I uh, imply software supply chain. Uh, we'll learn about the problem through a simple case study, is an application and a supply chain attack, very much focused on cloud native infrastructure. Uh, from there, we'll try to define the problem space and uh, therefore, how can we navigate through this problem space uh, via threat modeling supply chains? And then we'll find out how, hopefully, to secure and to harden the supply chain, what's available to us. Um, right, so what are the um, existential questions uh, we ask ourselves, at least the security folks, uh, uh, when trying to um, address the supply chain uh, problem? Uh, where does our code come from? Uh, where does it go? Uh, what do we actually ingest? And um, how can it go wrong? And what can we do? about that and this is only scratching the, uh, the the surface right because as we will discover pretty soon the issue is much bigger than we think so what is the supply chain problem and to define it uh, we probably want to define what a supply chain is and in the traditional um in the traditional sense the supply chain is anything that we depend on uh, military um need to know where all the hardware they uh, they buy and uh, the software they, they consume come from and who builds them in a very accurate way because of course they need to protect uh, against state attacks against targeting their their um their infrastructure and products uh, perhaps by attacking their supply chain and the same happens for pharmaceutical companies right they they that's uh, critical to human safety to produce uh, drugs uh, um, in a certain way and therefore they need to know the provenance all, of, of all their ingredients. Now that's a classic supply chain. In, in cloud native supply chain and more in general in a um, software supply chain, um, things are similar but a little different. So this is a very simple example of a supply chain. We have our uh, trusted producer, our um, upstream producers. We ingest dependencies from them. We then build our code. Um, we then ship our trusted applications to a runtime. 
in the cloud native space is often uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and what can go wrong in this, uh, in this uh, uh, very simple supply chain? Well, say that a malicious actor, instead of targeting us directly, what they do, they target uh, one of the dependencies we ingest from these third parties, right? Well, potentially, if they are smart, and usually they are, um, our threat actor here, Captain Hashtag, uh, can inject a malicious payload. And those payloads, if we don't take precautions and if we don't put countermeasures in place, that payload can be baked in into our code and can get um, executed on our runtime. So, um, to go a little more into details, uh, another example, we uh, something which is used quite often, that payload is also um, often a reverse shell. A reverse shell, for, 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 for those of you who don't know, is basically a piece of code. Uh, once it lands on the target, uh, it establishes a reverse connection back to uh, a vantage point that the attacker controls. This is an egress connection out of our infrastructure. Uh, so it's more har it's harder to detect uh, than if it was inbound. And then piggybacking on this uh, uh, connection, the attacker can execute code in the, uh, in the reverse shell with the privileges of the user running the, the, the shell on the compromised endpoint. Now, how does that, that fit in in our example? Uh, let's look at the more specific example. So um, here we have uh, um, a Kubernetes cluster, for example. We have uh, our build pipeline sitting next to it. Uh, that's in pink there. We have our uh, third party dependencies being ingested. Uh, um, and then we have the you know, capital hashtag uh, vessel. Um, the attacker has two vantage points. One, a compromise supplier. One, the other one is the public internet and many attackers do have. Uh, so let's see what happens here. Say that the, um, the threat actor succeeds in ingesting a malicious payload in one of the dependencies we pull. When our pipeline uh, executes, the dependency is um, is pulled, is ingested, is baked into our code. So the resulting image or executables in general contain that malicious payload. And when the pipeline kicks that workload into uh, our production runtime, the reverse shell executes. The reverse shell executes uh, establishes an outbound connection to the other vantage point. Um, and through that um, outbound connection, the attacker can piggyback in, compromise the payload, um, compromise the workload, uh, and therefore have established presence in our infrastructure. And from there, uh, they can do basically, um, they can further compromise our infrastructure by laterally move, break out of the container. Uh, there are many possible bad scenarios out there. So in this sense, uh, uh, attackers can literally uh, weaponize our own pipelines. And um, attacking a supplier is one of the ways. The other ways are, in fact, the source code directly, so they can target our um, version controlled uh, repos. Um, they can target our developer machines. But they can also target our build infrastructure. Uh, they can also target our runtime environment. So basically, uh, the, the, the infrastructure we use to run our workloads. So every piece of that supply chain from upstream producer to our downstream customers, uh, it's, it's, uh, must be secured. Now, we seem to understand that the problem is significant. And why is that? Well, let's talk about the problem space. Um, the problem is significant because um, um, the problem space is huge. Um, the software supply chains can be really complex and actually multidimensional, right? So, and not only in terms of technology, um, the, we have people involved. And if there is something that uh, computer security teaches us uh, is that when people are involved, things get, can get complicated further. And then sometimes supply chains, they are under compliance and governance requirements. So in they're very flexible, but um, you know, their flexibility and complexity uh, may become a threat. They can introduce the, uh, they can introduce uh, blind spots, some non-deterministic behavior that we actually need to manage. And then when I say we, I say that on purpose because it's not only the security folks; it's everybody within the organization. Um, so, what do we do in front of such a, a, a large and complex issue, right? So uh, we don't use supply chains, uh, but that's a little late. Um, <laughs> we use them, uh, but we actually uh, don't care about securing them, but I don't think anybody wants to do it, or we can try to secure everything. And that is actually um, impossible. It's proven to be impossible. So what do we do about it then? Well, the approach we take a uh, control plane is that we threat model supply chains for our customers. And we also 
contribute in developing and adopting standards, best practices, reference architectures, and we keep improving them. Um, there is a quote here from CISA, organizations rarely control their entire software supply chain and lack authority to compel every organization in their supply chain to take prompt mitigation steps. So let's talk uh, about um, threat modeling supply chains with a view of trying to find a way to navigate through such a large problem space. How do you find where to focus first? So um, a control plane, as I said, that's the foundation for uh, all our engagements. We start with a threat model every single time. So let's see how we threat model supply chains. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, uh, I will use uh, this uh, reference architecture, very simple. Uh, top uh, left uh, corner, we have a uh, third party repos, things we ingest. We have three stages. We have a, a dev stage, a build and test stage, and then we have a deploy stage. Um, we have an, uh, um, an artifact and metadata storage. Um, and then we have our hungry uh, downstream customers accessing our applications running on our um, runtime. Now, uh, within the, mm, the dev stage, we have code repositories. Within the uh, build and test stage, we have a pipeline which executes a number of steps. And then within the runtime, we have a, another couple of steps. We have a, a fetch step to obtain, a, in this uh, example, those are images to then run as, as containers on, on, on our runtime. Um, and then, as I said, we have our downstream customers consuming those applications. Um, so how do we threat model this? So we start from what threat model is. Uh, threat modeling is is um, a systematic approach that wants to bring everyone at the same table. As I said, not only security folks, we want developers, managers, uh, um, even representatives uh, from the uh, upstream producers, if possible, from your own supply chain. It's more informal than the uh, risk management because it doesn't really require an established risk framework, although it very much benefits from it. If the um, organization has a larger risk management framework in place, uh, we can then uh, fill that gap through the threat modeling between the technical infrastructure and that established uh, risk uh, framework organization-wide. It should happen uh, early in the design and build uh, uh, processes. Um, it focuses very much on data and data flows. That's why the reference architecture has all those steps. Uh, aids in finding and addressing security risk. Ultimately, that's what uh, wants to do. And the good thing is that it derives tactical and actionable data in the form of attack trees uh, and therefore security controls and countermeasure, as we will find pretty soon. The, um, the, the process is uh, actually a loop and split in four stages. In stage one or step one, we ask ourselves what we are building. In step two, we, are, um, ask, we ask ourselves what's the worst that could happen, then how we can reduce the risk of bad things happening. And then in step four, we ask ourselves, did we actually do a good job? Again, let's see more in details. Uh, in step one, what are we building? So this very large software supply chain uh, we, we have, or we want to put in place. Uh, what are the uh, components and the trust boundaries? of the individual components. What are the data flows in place? Then we want to ask ourselves what the use cases are. Why are we designing and deploying and operating this supply chain? Uh, then we ask ourselves what the business impact is against confidentiality and integrity and, um, and availability. Should a compromise of the supply chain or one of its components uh, happen? And then the operating model, again, who does what, who is uh, operating the supply chain, uh, who consume it uh, and maintains it. Um, in, uh, in, in particular, if the threat model exercise, if your supply chains are very complex, uh, we always recommend to decouple individual components and scope it down, make sure the threat model is uh, manageable. Eventually, uh, different components may war warrant uh, for individual threat models and what you can do then is establish uh, the um, reference you can reference uh, different threat models to establish a uh, compl uh, complex uh, um, combinations and to uh, model complex attacks but try to keep it manageable then in step two as i said we ask ourselves what's the worst that could happen so we come up with um, scenarios literally um, we do um, scenarios of bad things that can happen we understand the threats what are the top threats uh, uh, mapped to business risk? 
involved in the, or uh, in triggering uh, those scenarios. And based on that, we then define attack path, paths. So what does the threat actor need to do to eventually uh, exploit a potential threat? And then we generate uh, attack trees based on these uh, um, paths because attack, uh, attack trees are really helpful uh, to, to, to have a visual representation of the attack and therefore to really well understand how to stop an attack from happening. But when we talk about threats, that's very high level. In the context of uh, software supply chains, those are threats to what? Uh, our view is that those are threats essentially to supply chain security properties uh, that we want and we actually must preserve uh, along our supply chain. For instance, in this example, is integrity. Integrity on the stuff we uh, ingest in, from third parties, integrity of our own code, integrity of our build environment and the artifacts we produce, integrity of our runtime environment and how we actually run um, our, our software and to our downstream customers. And let's see, for example, um, how integrity can be compromised. Then this is where we map uh, uh, potentially threats on the different components. And we show, for example, then um, there could be a bad code, uh, code submit, uh, willingly or unwillingly to our code repos. There could be code tampering that would compromise the integrity of the code as it is ingested in our uh, pipelines. Uh, there could be a compromised source control. There could be um, a way by which um, a, a, an actor could bypass uh, our CI/CD um, pipelines and load the workloads straight on our production runtimes. Or there may be ways to replace artifacts, compromising the integrity of our uh, artifact storage and metadata storage. These are the threats we are trying to address. Um, after, again, we identify threats, scenarios, we map out, as I said, attack trees. Uh, very useful. Attack trees are graphical representation of the potential infiltration vectors. They work uh, uh, in, uh, in their sequential, there, there are steps, uh, and they work using and or logical conditions um, to uh, detail in a visual way what is necessary um, what the attacker needs to do in order to be successful in that attack. Why attack trees are very useful? Because then when we ask ourselves how we can reduce the risk of bad things happening, we can introduce security controls uh, to break those attack chains. So we say, look, these are the security controls uh, available to us. Uh, um, we use them in this specific way to make sure the attacker cannot uh, go along the attack chain in, by, by the, you know, uh, in, in that way. So we break the attack chain. And, uh, and as I said, we have controls, uh, we know how to implement them, but then how we monitor if we did a good job, right? So we want to uh, rerun a quick threat model to understand the inheritor and residual risks uh, of the threats we identified at the beginning. Then we want to uh, perhaps uh, build test suites to make sure the implementation of our controls is effective. So, you know, they can actually withstand attacks. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, plan for a pen test. So, you know, beside of the automated uh, validation of those controls, we do some hands-on work uh, to make sure the, um, to make sure, you know, to gain some further assurance about the quality of the implementation of our security controls. And then as the, you know, in the ever evolving threat landscape, um, we revise constantly our threat model to respond to those uh, changes. How am I doing it with time? Doing fine. Right, so uh, we understood uh, uh, there is an issue. We have a way to navigate through the problem space, uh, understand what the scenarios are, what the um, threat could be, and how threats can actually lead to uh, successful attacks. And we have a way to, you know, to define security controls to then break those attack chains. But when we talk about security controls, uh, what security controls? What's available to us? Well, the good news is that um, uh, recently um, there was, a, you know, because of the rise of a, a, a increased number of uh, attacks to our supply chains, uh, there was a lot of interest from the security uh, community um, to develop uh, frameworks and um, reference architectures to guide teams into securing and hardening their supply chains. Because um, the sooner you do it, just the better it is. And if you have guidance, that's why it's out there to help uh, the technical folks. Now, let's then talk uh, about securing supply chains. Um, what controls uh, and um, frameworks are available, as I said. Now, 
because we are uh, operating uh, as a consultancy in the cloud native space, uh, these references are to, you know, uh, mostly to um, uh, things produced by the Cloud Native Community Foundation, three great initiatives. Uh, at the top, we have the Cloud Native Computer Foundation Software Supply Chain Best Practices White Paper is an absolutely go absolute goldmine of controls. Uh, and we will talk about it uh, um, uh, in the next slides. And then derived from the white paper that, again, sets the high level controls and principles, uh, there is something called Secure Software Factory, which is an actual reference architecture, a logical representation of a supply chain that implements those uh, controls and best practices as detailed uh, by the web paper. But then uh, for the more technical folks, uh, we have something called Fresca or Factory for Views Repeatable Secure Creation of Artifacts, which is an actual technology stack uh, um, to then uh, that can be used uh, to implement that reference architecture called Secure Software Factory that implements controls and guidelines and best practices as detailed on the white paper. So um, let's go through the white paper again. Um, <clears throat> I recommend you download it. Is everything is, is open sourced. Uh, so just scan the QR code or Google it. Uh, you can download a PDF. Uh, um, the paper um, is actually kept up to, it was originated and kept up to date by uh, tax security. And uh, Control Plane is heavily involved in tax security. So if you ever need something else, just reach out to us. Um, the security principles as outlined in the white paper for building or hardening uh, secure supply chains um, are around four foundations. Verification, automation, con maintaining a controlled environment, uh, and then establish secure authentication and access. Uh, so these are the principles. Um, it focuses, and these principles are declined on five stages of your, of your supply chain. The, the source code, the materials, what you ingest, the pipelines, how you build the code, the artifacts, what you produce, uh, and the deployments, how you uh, run those, uh, um, how you actually run your applications on, on your runtime. And um, let's go a bit into more details. I have uh, here an extract of a few things I thought were very appropriate based on the audience uh, uh, for each of the five stages. Again, keeping in mind the four foundations. So in the stage of securing the source code, uh, verification, the white paper, um, one of the uh, controls uh, is to require signed commits from your developers in the automation space uh, to prevent committing secret to repo. So to establish a, a, a way, whatever works for you, to make sure that uh, whatever code is um, pushed into the repo doesn't contain secrets. And then control the environments, enforce the 4i principles. So make sure there is a um, there are peer there are peer reviews uh, for uh, changes uh, to the code, or maybe use protected branch feature if your um, source controlled repo implements it. And then secure authentication and, and access, and for MFA for accessing repos, and then use a shorter lived ephemeral credentials for machine and services access. Uh, moving to the next stage, securing the materials. So what we ingest from third parties, uh, verification automation in the verification space, uh, verify third party artifacts and open source libraries, uh, build based upon source code if possible, rather than ingesting um, Exit, um, compile code, define and prioritize trusted packet managers and repo. So lock down the sources of your third party uh, inge uh, software ingestion, and then generate an immutable S bomb uh, for the code. And then automation, scan software for vulnerabilities. Again, the control is at high level. You then do it in the way you, uh, that works for your organization. Uh, moving on to the next stage, uh, securing the build pipelines, uh, uh, verification, automation, control environments, secure authentication, uh, verification space uh, uh, control is to validate runtime security of build workers, uh, uh, the, the, the workers actually building your, involved in your uh, CICD pipelines, uh, automation, um, build and related CICD steps should all be automated through a pipeline defined as code. Uh, that helps uh, preserving also a controlled environment uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it's very deterministic uh, who does what uh, 
and what uh, what's the remit uh, for each of the build worker because it's the finest code uh, because the pipeline is the finest code and then write the output of your execution uh, to a separate secured um, storage repo and as i said in the context of uh, um, making sure our pipeline are as deterministic as possible, only allow pipeline modifications through pipeline as code. Moving to the securing the artifact stage, um, verification, um, web paper recommends to sign every step in the build process uh, or validate the signatures generated at each step. Automation, use a store to manage metadata, uh, control the environment, limit which artifacts any given part is authorized to certify, and then secure access, encrypt artifacts before distribution so that only authorized parties can retrieve uh, and execute those. Securing the deployments, um, verification and automation, ensure clients can perform verification of artifacts and associated metadata, and then ensure my clients can verify the freshness of these files. Um, but then, Additional controls uh, uh, can be making sure you have admission control at runtime to um, make sure only what's authorized to run can actually run. And again, you lock down your runtime as much as you can. Now, Secure Software Factory reference architecture that implements those guidelines and controls uh, um, adopts the secure software, the software factory paradigm uh, for designing a, so, a secure software supply chain. As I said, built on the uh, foundations um, detailed in the white paper, um, the, the approach is a defense in depth for controls. Defense in depth is not dead as uh, uh, appears to be in the um, network security world. Um, signing and verification of artifacts of everything artifact metadata analytics uh, and focuses a lot on um, automation. Um, now, the, the, the Secure Software Factory cornerstones uh, and the controls are uh, around three critical concerns. Uh, provenance verification, uh, AKA the assurance that the claims of where and how an artifact originates from are true and that the artifact or the uh, metadata associated have not been tampered with. And then trustworthiness, so the assurance that a given artifact and its actual content can be trusted to do what is built to do. And then dependencies, uh, the, so to do recursive checks uh, um, of an artifact uh, dependency tree uh, for trustworthiness and provenance uh, of the artifact it itself uh, uses. And then by stages of activity, pre-build, aka development and handling of the uh, source code and dependencies, a build, process of building, testing, and packaging an artifact according to its build specifications, and post-build, so um, concerned with storage, delivery, deployment, and continuous um, verification. We are going to, to towards the end. Uh, so we spoke about the problem, we spoke about a uh, use case uh, um, to address then a larger, much larger problem space uh, through threat modeling of supply chains. We understood that controls, uh, uh, frameworks, uh, countermeasures are available to you. I also put together a roundup of other good stuff uh, uh, to harden your base images, uh, to harden your code, uh, to, harden, to further harden your build. Uh, and uh, to, in general, uh, adopt best practices uh, around application images. We don't have time to go through these uh, uh, individually uh, now, but the presentation will be available to you. So, and again, any question uh, or doubt, feel free to reach out anytime. Now, what are the key takeaways of this talk? At least I hope. Um, the um, securing software supply chains is a, a very hard problem, has a large problem space. Threat model everything you can, again, um, I cannot stress enough the importance of threat modeling to navigate through such a large problem space and prioritize drive expenditure, assuming a risk aware and a risk driven um, approach. Principles, frameworks, guidelines, and controls are available. Are available. Um, the ones I showed you are actually open sourced. You can download at any time, contribute as well. Um, the community is actually very focused on uh, attracting more talent and at the point of view of the industry are the people actually using those frameworks. Uh, uh, retrofitting um, slow or and or slowly maturing uh, uh, your supply chain security is the way to go. No big banks approach uh, work here. Um, do it slowly. Again, addressing the top risks first. Uh, and as I said, you're not alone. Join and contribute. Uh, um, we always welcome contribution.
Uh, that said, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I would love to take any question. There are a few questions. So right. one relates to, firstly, your discussion on reverse shells and whether it is feasible to have a egress gateway to lock down outgoing traffic. Um, fe technically feasible. Um, it depends very much on your use cases. So I always tend to recommend it. Do some egress filtering too. And it goes back to one of the controls I mentioned about uh, lock down the number of destinations from which you pull, uh, uh, for example, dependencies, uh, uh, trusted repos, and then you block anything else. So indeed, um, if it's feasible, do it uh, and make sure you reduce uh, those uh, um, the, the, the likelihood of a reverse shell being a, a, a possible uh, attack vector. Mm -hmm. And there's also a question I'd like to ask because you talked about threat modeling. You're the experts. We understand this. When being involved in threat modeling in the past, I've there's been kind of a process shock to a lot of uh, management and non-security people, I would say. How would you have some advice for these people of what they're getting into when it comes to the threat modeling process and how to mitigate that kind of process shock so they can transition into the, the experience smoothly? Mm -hmm. um, that comes very much from experience. So if you have experienced uh, a threat modelers, uh, they can articulate the risk uh, depending on audiences, different audiences. And the key is to uh, find a way to articulate technical risk to a non-technical audience. Uh, there is something that comes handy here, uh, is the uh, NIST 839 standard. Uh, that is built uh, on a pyramid of three layers, three tiers, uh, organizational risk, uh, process risk and information um, um, information systems risk. And again, telling that story vertically, how to map uh, tactical risk uh, on the information system back to organizational risk, uh, that helps very much into keeping everybody engaged at the same table. So check out NIST 839, we, we sometimes use it. Okay. Um, um, 839, uh, Klaus. And then there was a third question on recommending risk models for startup companies if you have any thoughts <laughs> um, on that so we we are a startup effectively um we uh what we did uh, for our internal risk management if that's the question we came up with a custom um version of a uh, nist 839 to be addressing again organizational risk aka ceo run over by a bus um all the way down to information, information system tactical risk. Uh, if you take that standard and you simplify as much as needed to make sure you have something that you can start using tomorrow, I think that's that's something that worked for us and that's something I would recommend you doing as well. Okay. Uh, drop me an email if you're interested. Um, it's name.surname at control-plane.io. Mm -hmm. And we do seem to have one question about which group of people owns the supply chain security? Um, usually different teams. Um, the, uh, why we try to break these at the same table, you have the, um, it depends, for example, if you, how you provision infrastructure, how developers work, um, usually that is a shared responsibility model. And that's why we try to bring everybody at the same table to have a, a, a synchronous conversation. Uh, usually supply chain security, the security itself is owned by um, the security team, um, but the risk owners uh, are usually non-technical people. That's why, again, at the same table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I think that covers it for all the questions we have. So thank you for joining us and delivering this excellent presentation. It was really cool to see from my side. So. Very happy thanks. to be presenting this. And thanks a lot, Darren, for having me. And, and, you know, anything, reach out. We are always available. Hi, we're from Epico, the proud organizer of the DevOps conference. Our goal is to uncover cutting edge talks, emerging ideas, and DevOps trends, providing a global forum for practitioners and decision makers to learn and grow. We would love to also explore how we can help you excel in DevOps together. Visit us at epico.com and enjoy the inspiring talks at the DevOps conference.